Well, good morning, Temple friends, family, guests. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. And uh, here at Temple, we like to begin all of our services with the reading of God's Word. This morning, we're going to be in the Gospel of John, chapter 14. And these are verses 26 and 27. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. What a great word we have this morning from the Gospel of John as we continue our series in the Trinity. This morning we speak of the Holy Spirit. Uh, let's pray together before we join Nathan and go to worship. Father God, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for all of the great things you give us, God. We thank you so much for the gift of Christ, God. We thank you for the gift of the Spirit and the Counselor that is with us in all that we do. God, be with us this morning. Let us glorify you in word and song as we praise your name. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm so glad that we get to worship together this morning. As we're going into worship, let's just remember that our hope is found in Christ. There's nothing that we can do as people to save ourselves, right? That's why in John 14, you know, it says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus says that no one can come to the Father except through me. So any hope that we have comes from the Lord. There's a Charles Spurgeon quote that I love, and it says, Don't just merely look to your hope. Look to Christ, who's the source of your hope. All of the hope that we have isn't valid enough unless it comes through Christ. It's not strong enough. It's not good enough unless our hope comes through Christ in Christ, the hope that we have within him and his goodness and his faithfulness. So as we worship, let's just remember that and let's sing praises to our Savior. I've been held by the Savior I fell fire from above I've been down to the river And I ain't the same The prodigal return And all my hope is in Jesus Thank God that yesterday's gone and all my sins are forgiven And I've been washed by the blood And I'm no stranger to the prison I've worn shackles and chains But I've been freed and forgiven I'm not going back, Lord, I'll never be the same. And all my hope is in Jesus. Thank God my yesterday is gone. And all my sins are forgiven. And I've been washed by the blood. There's a kind of thing that just breaks a man Breaks him down to his knees And God, I've been broken more than a time or two And then he picked me up and showed me what it means to be a man
the blood I've been washed by the blood So as we finish worship, I wanted to read a Bible verse real quick, and it says in Psalm 145, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. And that right there is one of the many, many reasons that we worship the Lord, is the fact that he is a great, great Lord. He's a great Savior. He's a great provider and he loves us even when we didn't deserve it you know I think of you know my dad or you know youth pastors that I've grown up with or you know other pastors that I that have impacted my life and they've been great people right but the one thing that they all have in common is that they're sinners they they have failed me in some way whether it was really big whether it was really small one way or another they don't measure up to the Lord's greatness because they're sinful people. And that doesn't, you know, knock them or anything. They're all fantastic guys, and, I, and I'm glad that I got to be poured into by them. But the big thing that they would all remind me is that, one, they are sinners, but two, that our Savior, our Lord, is great. And so as we sing this last song, as we close out our service together, um, let's just praise him because he's worthy to be praised. Great is the Lord and worthy to be praised. You give life, you are love, you bring light into the darkness You give hope, you restore Every heart that is broken Great are you, Lord It's your breath in our lungs So we
guys, Pastor Matt here, and I've got just a couple of announcements for you this morning. Uh, the first is this coming week, Wednesday night, it starts, I can't wait, Mission Deep Sea, our vacation Bible school, kindergarten through fifth grade. There's still time to sign up. Uh, we are just so excited for great food, um, great fellowship, and just such great lessons we're going to have all week long. Again, you can still sign up at templechurch.net. We'll meet every evening at... Um, at five or at six p.m. I'm sorry, six p.m. and it'll be going till about seven thirty, eight o'clock ish. Uh, we'll be we'll be wrapping it up, but we can't wait to see your kids there. We can't wait for you to come out and join us. Just have a great time. Vacation Bible School starting this Wednesday through Saturday. Uh, also coming up is our mock student camp. That'll be the second week of August. Uh, again, same times at six till about. 8, 9 o'clock time frame for those guys, uh, Monday through Friday, that one, the second week of August. You can sign up now at templechurch.net. We'd love for you to come out and join us for that. Uh, also coming up is our um, Temple uh, Monteith Golf Tournament. We have this every year. This year um, it is in September on the 10th. We'd love for you to bring out a team on that Friday and join us uh, at Williamsburg National for such a great day of fellowship. And all proceeds of that go directly to... Um, the missions team, as well as our Temple Kids and Mock Student Ministries. Each of those is such a great thing, and this golf tournament just blesses us throughout the year. So we'd love for you to come out, bring a team, bring some family, some friends, and join us for a day of golf. Uh, also coming up in September is our men's retreat out at Camp Piankatank. We're going to have some great speakers, some great time, great food, and we'll be staying over at Piankatank um, that Friday night. You can sign up. More details available at templechurch.net. Now here at Temple, we also like to remind you um, of a biblical reason for giving. Uh, we appreciate your gifts. We thank you so much for that. But we want to remind you that it's not just giving to Temple Baptist, but it's giving to the glory of God. It's giving back to God. Uh, we're able to utilize uh, those gifts that come in to do things like VBS and mock. These are free camps we offer here at Temple. And uh, at the time that we're recording this, we have 40 children signed up for a vacation Bible school. And I just want to say thank you. That that's not just 40 children coming to have fun, but that's an opportunity to take the gospel to the next generation. And it's just something that's so heavy on my heart, and I'm so thankful that we're able to do things like this. So thank you so much for your generosity, and just let me pray over today's giving. Father God, I thank you for this day. I thank you, God, for just the opportunity to worship you, to, to praise you, to give to you. God, as we come together and as we look at the, the giving and just the, the gifts that we give to, to the church for your glory, God, I just want to pray to you and thank you, God, for the opportunity to give to your mission. God, that as we give, it's not going just to keep the lights on and, and water. God, no, this is all utilized for the gospel. God, that we are utilizing all that we have to take your message, the good news of Christ, the good news of the gospel, from where we are here in Newport News to the ends of the earth. God, thank you for that opportunity, and let all that we do bless you, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, Temple friends, family guests. Thank you for joining us this morning on our uh, online worship, and I hope you're enjoying our current series on the Trinity. If you've missed any of the previous messages, you can find them at our YouTube channel. The first message given by Pastor West was an overview of the Trinity and the, the importance of that doctrine to our Christian faith. Followed by a look at God the Father. Uh, last week we looked at God the Son, and today we get the easy one, right? It's, it's the Holy Spirit. Um, so I'm really excited. I hope you're ready for this. And before we jump into the Holy Spirit, uh, I have a couple facts I want to share with you. So the Barner Group, they're, they're a research group, conducted a study in 2010, and the results are, are a little bit shocking. So when they responded to the results, uh, 1,871 self-described Christians were asked about their perception of God. The area observed uh, in these were characteristics of God, beliefs of Satan, and beliefs about the Holy Spirit. And this is where I want to draw our attention today is that last one, the Holy Spirit. So in regards to the Holy Spirit, 58% of individual surveys stated that the Holy Spirit is just a symbol of God's power or presence, but it's not a living entity. Just 34% stated that the Holy Spirit is a living force. Now, I'm so thankful for the Barnard Group and the work that they do because they also bring to note some other aspects of Scripture. You know, that's a pretty startling fact, as we're going to find out in Scripture today that the Holy Spirit is, in fact, the third person of the Godhead. But out of all of those individuals that were surveyed, you know, we just saw those numbers. Um, 
in regard to the 58% that, that believed it to be a symbol of God's power, not a, a living entity, 58%, so over half of those individuals um, also believe that the Bible is totally accurate in all that it says and all that it teaches. So there's a little bit of disconnect there because the Bible itself, as I want to show you today, speaks of the fact that the Holy Spirit is in fact God and is in fact a person of the Trinity. So I'm so excited and what I want to show you today are the principles and, and truths found in God's Word regarding the Holy Spirit. So don't get overwhelmed. I know we've gone over a lot already. We've looked at this misconception that the Barner Group has found, and we're going to break the Holy Spirit down into four main ideas. The way we're going to work is first and foremost is that the Holy Spirit is in fact a he and not an it. It is not an essence or a thing or a force, if you will. It is a person. Uh, the second thing we're going to look at is the Holy Spirit is in fact God. Third is the Holy Spirit is a person. Now, once we've justified those aspects that the, the Holy Spirit is in fact God and also is in fact the third person of the Trinity, we're going to try to answer an important question for each of us, and that is, how should I respond to the Holy Spirit? So let's open up right there with that first point in the fact that the Holy Spirit is not an it, it is in fact a he. Throughout this morning, and as you reflect on the sermon, I want you to have an understanding that the Holy Spirit is more than an essence. It is God within us. We're going to speak more to this point as we observe uh, the Holy Spirit as God, the Holy Spirit as a person. But if you remember back two weeks, I, I said something towards the end of my sermon that really ties into today. It ties into the fact that when we have our Father who loves us so much in heaven, He is the giver of gifts. And instead of just giving us gifts, He gave us the giver in the Holy Spirit. And that's going to really tie into the end of today's message. So I want to put that in your mind. I want you to be thinking about that as we talk about the third person of the Trinity. So as we establish these truths found in God's Word, let's begin with understanding that the Holy Spirit is in fact God. Um, typically, Pastor Wes and I, as, as we preach and teach, we like to, to go through books of the Bible. We like to camp out in a specific area of Scripture or specific, sometimes two or three verses and hold you to it. Uh, today's going to be a little bit different. We're going to be jumping around. So if you have your Bible, and, and I hope that you do, I really encourage you to bookmark two specific areas this morning. Uh, the first is the Gospel of John. Go ahead and flip it anywhere in there. We're going to be all through the Gospel of John beginning to end towards the end of this sermon. But once you have that bookmarked, flip it over to 1 Samuel. We're going to start in the book of 1 Samuel and, and then move to John's Gospel there here in a, little, in a little while. So after we've understood the Spirit as a person, it's, it's not an it, it's a he, we have to understand the Holy Spirit is God. Now, you might ask, you know, Matt, how, how are we going to see the Holy Spirit as God in 1 Samuel? You know, the Spirit was given after the ascension of Christ uh, in Pentecost and in Acts 2. We, we know that through the Gospels, through Acts. And, and you're right, that's when the Spirit was, was given to believers. It came um, upon them, and we're going to hit that in just a little while. But we can actually observe the fact the Holy Spirit was with God from the very beginning. From the very, very beginning of, of God's Word, Genesis 1.1, we know that God, and the word there used is Elohim. And it's a plural phrase for God that is utilized. Beyond that, we, we know there that, that it's a plural. So we're like, okay, well, who is there with God at, at creation? Well, Genesis 1-2 helps answer that. You know, we, we get John 1-1 where it says the, the beginning was the Word, the Word was with Him, and the Word was Him. We, we know that the Jesus, so we know the Father, we know the Son. Well, Genesis 1-2 says this, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. See that? There it is, Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2. We have uh, 1, 1 where we see the plur plural, plur plurality of the persons of God. And then in, in 1, 2, we see that the Spirit there is hovering. And, and if you flipped over there, highlight that, uh, that, that word there again, that the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. That, that's going to be important again later. So throughout the entirety of the Bible, we can observe the person of the Godhead, of the, the Holy Spirit. And we're going to observe the Spirit today in 1 Samuel. Now, we don't have time to go through the entire book or even through the entire uh, aspects of the references to the Spirit in the whole Old Testament, but we are able to see these references really well in 1 Samuel. The opening chapters, and, and I want to give you a brief overview here of Samuel before we, we dive into our specific aspects, uh, just so we have a mindset of where we are. So those opening chapters of Samuel show the birth and anointing of the last great judge, the, the namesake, Samuel. He was also a prophet and a priest. 
And then chapters 8 through 15 show the kingship and reign of King Saul. Remember, first king of Israel. Saul's story is helpful for the Holy Spirit as the Spirit worked in the life of Saul. If you read too quickly or you don't take in all of God's words, you, you might even miss the aspects of the, the role of the Spirit there in Samuel, in, in the, the life of King Saul. You see, Saul's to be anointed uh, by Samuel as the first king. Following a meal and the return of a few lost donkeys, Saul's going to meet a group of prophets coming through uh, the, the high place, as it's labeled in Scripture. And let's join them in 1 Samuel chapter 10. So we'll be in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 10, and we're going to start in verse 5. It says, After that you shall come to Gibbeth Elohim, where there is a garrison of the Philistines. And there, as soon as you come to the city, you'll meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with harp, tambourine, flute, and lyre before them, prophesying. Then the Spirit of the Lord will rush upon you, and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. Saul, the man who had been anointed king. But it's, it's not through the man, right? We, we see this here. We see the promises given by Samuel to Saul. It, it, it's through the Holy Spirit that he's empowered to lead God's people. I love the end of verse 6 that we just read. Let's, let's look at it closely because it, it'll also apply to us today and how we respond there, there later to the Spirit. It says, The Spirit of the Lord will rush upon you. And Saul would be, be, be look at this here, turned into another man. The Spirit of God changes Saul. Verse 7 assists with this so well. And it also shows us um, the Spirit of, of God here in verse 7. It says, Once the Spirit is upon Saul and he is a changed man, Samuel tells him, Now when these signs meet you, do what your hand finds to do, for God is with you. So it's not just that the Spirit's going to come upon you and that you're going to change and, and then, then it's over. No. Verse 7 clarifies this, that God is with Saul. God is with Saul in the Spirit. So, we, we see here as Saul in chapter 10, and I know we're, we're moving a little fast, but I want to be sure we can get through all these concepts today. So we see God with Saul as the Spirit comes upon him, and we have some direct correlations to the Spirit being God. But let's jump forward a little bit further to chapter 16. You all know the story of, of Saul and, and how he starts to, to defy God and, and not live the, the, the way that he's called. And, and due to that, remember there's a, another king. We get David and his anointment. And this moves the kingship from Saul to David. And, and it's such a great thing we see in chapter 16 of that, again, this kingship is not done by man. It's done by God. Verse 13 says, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. Sound familiar? Similar action here. We know that it was God who worked through Saul's anointing to make Saul king. And it was by the indwelling of the Spirit. The Spirit rushed upon him, came upon him. When we realize, hey, there needs to be another king, this isn't a bunch of men coming around at nights. Things that It's not an overthrowing of Saul. It's actually God appointing his predecessor. He goes to David. There's the anointment again. And it's not the oil that does it. No, it's, that's a, a sign. But here we get the rushing of the, the Spirit of the Lord upon David from this day forward. The Spirit of the Lord, again, is the one who empowers the leader of God's people. You know, we're able to see in Saul and in David how God is at work through the work of the Spirit. From this perspective of the doctrine of the Spirit and the narratives of really 1 Samuel chapters 10, 11, 16, 18, and 19, we observe the fact of the role of the Spirit and the presence of the Spirit throughout the Old Testament. The Spirit of God in 1 Samuel involves Himself intimately in the lives of Israel's leaders. This, again, isn't just, okay, God's upon you, go. No, it's, it's a relationship with God. He empowers them for service, working within their hearts and sovereignly guiding their paths. The Holy Spirit is God with the leaders of God's people. 1 Samuel 10 is important because it shows that Samuel's prophecy and its fulfillment indicate a relationship here between the activity of the Holy Spirit and the activity of God. The fact that the Holy Spirit is, in fact, God. The relationship between the activity as well as the, the Spirit's relation to the presence of God identify the Spirit's activity as God's activity and the Spirit's presence with God's presence. This is how we're able to show the unity of the Spirit being the third person of the Trinity, the Spirit being God. 
So, now we, we've observed the fact that the Spirit is God. Let's move to the second section here, that the Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. The Spirit is a person. I ask you to bookmark the Gospel of John. So go ahead and flip there. And as we observe the personhood of the Holy Spirit and uh, how we should respond to the Spirit, we'll, we'll be spending the majority of the rest of our time here camped out on John. The Gospel of John is one that Clement of Alexandria labels it as a spiritual gospel. And I, I just love that. Um, a good New Testament professor, Andres Kostenberger, states that John's gospel is Trinitarian in an obvious, non-controversial sense. John presents the Father, the Son, and the Spirit as three characters whose identities are bound together in a profound and mutually determining way. The first half of John's gospel is so awesome. Really, if you look at chapters 1 through 13, it's primarily a relationship between the Father and the Son. Now, there are aspects of the Spirit that we're going to see in those first 13 chapters, but it's very heavy on the Father-Son dynamic. It's the second half of the Gospel, primarily chapters 14 through 16, that the Spirit's identity comes into the forefront in a major way. So, the Spirit may not be in the forefront in those first 13 chapters, but it's there. And we're going to take a closer look at those instances first before we jump in to the latter part and the, the emphasis on the Spirit, because there are a couple important things we need to see at the beginning of John. So open up right there to John chapter 1, and this is the first time the Spirit's mentioned in John's Gospel. It, I love it. It's one of my favorite um, aspects of all four Gospels. It's, it's in the um, all, each of them. So flip over to verse 32. This is, uh, again, a reference that's found in the Synoptic Gospels as well and occurs at Jesus' baptism. Uh, and I told you guys earlier that Genesis 1, verse 2, to, to highlight that part, because there's a great reference here in John chapter 1, verse 32, that ties directly back to Genesis 1, verse 2. Uh, and it says this, And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. The Spirit coming upon Jesus was to give John the, the Baptist certainty that this was the one he'd been waiting for. As with the synoptic witnesses, the baptism of Jesus involves an explicit Trinitarian account. It's a time where we have the Son being baptized, the Father speaking down, talking about this is His Son, and with Him I am well pleased. And we have the Spirit ascending down upon Him. We see all parts of that Trinity there. The process continues as John, uh, in John as uh, Jesus tells Nicodemus, the kingdom of God cannot be experienced unless a person is born again. Again, something that had to have sound crazy to Nicodemus. But Jesus expands in verse 5. He says, Jesus answered, Truly I tell you, unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh. Whatever is born of the Spirit is spirit. So important here that we observe that these comments from Jesus show that regeneration clearly is the sovereign act of the Spirit in the believer. That when you're born of the Spirit... It is the spirit that is in you. And if, if you're of the flesh, then that is flesh. And over and over again, we're told the difference of flesh and spirit throughout uh, really the gospel acts. We see it again throughout Paul's epistles and the importance of being born in the spirit. Now, as we look at these interactions of the spirit, the son and the father, it's important to have an understanding of how a person is defined. See, theologians and philosophers alike have stated that a person is a being who finds his or her identity in relation to another person. Clearly, this is observed in the interaction of the Holy Spirit with the Father and Son that we, we just talked about, that we see the, the Spirit interacting with Christ at the baptism. We see Jesus interacting uh, as well with the Spirit as he's speaking with Nicodemus about the need for the Spirit and that regeneration, that rebirth. So let's also talk about how the Holy Spirit interacts with believers. So, this is where we move from that first half, those first 13 chapters, to chapters 14 through 16. And, and these are really cool because this is actually called the Paraclete Sayings uh, about the Holy Spirit. And, and you can actually follow this all the way through to see how they apply to the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, to each of the persons of the Trinity. And that term Paraclete might sound kind of weird to you. Um, it actually comes from the Greek word Parakletos, which can be translated to helper, comforter, advocate, and each of those are good translations, but the best translation and the best term utilized here is counselor. 
Uh, this is utilized in the CSB translation. You see it in some verses uh, in the ESV as well. But that latter translation, the, the counselor, allows both the interpersonal and the legal dimension of that relationship to, to come to the forefront as a counselor. It's a personal thing, a guide, if you will, but also we've heard of, of a counselor in, in law aspects of, of the, the, the legality of a counselor. The parakletos dimension of the Holy Spirit can be observed in, in John 14, 16. Jesus tells of another counselor. It, it's paramount for us to understand the personhood of the Holy Spirit, that it's not an it, it's not an essence, that the Holy Spirit is a he, it's a person. As the Father and Son have shown to be the persons of the Trinity in preceding weeks, here we observe that the Spirit is a parakletos, a, a counselor for us, just as the Son was in, in 1 John 2, 1, where it, in speaking of Christ, it says, My little children, I'm writing these things to you that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Here we see uh, John writing again, and he says, We have an advocate, Christ. We have a counselor, someone who's there for us. We see the advocate or counselor is with the Father. The Holy Spirit has been shown to be equal with the Son and in such with, with the Father as well. Throughout Scripture, we're able to observe how the Father, Son, and Spirit each work as a comforter, as a counselor, as an advocate, as a helper to us. I told you two weeks ago that our Father loved us so much that He didn't just give us gifts. He didn't shower us with gifts. He, he could have easily. But instead of that, he gave us the giver. You know, as we look at these paraclete sayings, let, let's look at John 15, verse 26. When we get one of the greatest things that, that were promised in Scripture, it's Jesus is speaking and he says, When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. Key concepts here, guys. Key concepts on the personhood of the Holy Spirit. It says... He will bear witness about me. First of all, Jesus, as he's speaking, talks of the spirit and, and, and the pronoun of a person that he will help. The, the helper will come that's promised by the Father. So we see that interaction again, the personal interaction with the Father and the Son. We're not alone. We have a helper that was sent by Jesus from the Father. We can observe that the person of the spirit has a relationship with both the Father and the Son. And as we see that, we need to observe also how that spirit has a relationship with you and I, with believers. You see, believers are united in the spirit with an extremely intimate relationship. It's not just, again, like a, yeah, I'm, I'm a buddy or a pal. No, this is an intimate relationship between the Holy Spirit and the believer. As a believer, you, four things um, happen to you that involve the spirit. The first one is Baptize, you're baptized with the Holy Spirit. And we're going to break each of these down a little further in a second. The second is that you receive the Spirit without measure. How good is that? That without measure, you can't measure how great God is and, and the Spirit that is, is within you. And you worship in the Spirit and you have the Spirit um, flow from deep within you. These promises are reinforced by the promises earlier that the counselor will come to you found in John 16, 7. Each of those, the, the baptized in the Spirit, something where you are, are sealed on the day of your acceptance and faith in Christ is found in John 1. You see the, the Spirit is without measure in John 3. We worship in the Spirit in John 4. All of these promises, the Spirit is what begins that new life of the believer. When you put your faith in Christ, you're immediately baptized in the Spirit. You're a new creation. It doesn't occur because of a special prayer, coming forward or walking down an aisle or being uh, baptized in the, in the baptismal here at Temple. No, when you accept the work of Christ on the cross, you are baptized in the Spirit and made a new creation. And so often we want to be the center of God's Word, the center of the world. And we have to realize immediately that human beings do not control the Spirit in the process of being born again. The Spirit is a gift that comes from God at the time of faith in Christ Jesus. Beyond the Spirit giving life to the believer and all those things we just talked about, there are three personal things He does that we see throughout the latter part of John. The Spirit's going to teach, He's going to guide into all the truth, and He's going to bear witness to the Son of God. So, He's going to teach. Let's look at each of these individually. John 14, 26 says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you 
all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. How great is that, that we're going to have a teacher that's going to bring to remembrance all that Jesus has said. We, we know Jesus had a great ministry. We know that, that God's word is filled. And as we spend time and grow closer to God, that the spirit, the counselor, the advisor, the, the one that is with us will bring to remembrance all that Christ has promised and all that Christ has commanded. Beyond teaching us, he guides us in all truth. We see this later in John 16. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me and he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Again, Jesus speaking of the great truths and promises that he's made, that the spirit will, will guide us into those truths. And all that Jesus declared, he will declare to each and every one. We will glorify God because of the truths and the promises that he's given us. And in those truths, we come to that last thing I promise, that he will glorify God. I love John 15, 26. When the Helper comes, who I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. Bear witness. You know, that, that's really, brothers and sisters, what we're called to do. If we're believers and that Spirit is in us, we see the newness of life of being born in the Spirit, we understand those aspects and those promises that come to us. We know that we have a helper that teaches us. We have one that guides us into those truths. And because of those truths, we want to witness about the goodness of Christ. Each of those things that we just talked about, th those are things that people have to do. A person needs to do. You can't be taught. You can't be guided. You, you, you can't have a witness from a, a thing, a force, an it. No, it, it's personal, those things. Speaking to someone. I, I speak to my family, speak to my friends. I teach my children. And when we bear witness of Christ, that's something that's shown in a, a relationship. Uh, we call it here relational evangelism. Is we're, we're having that witness and relationship with other people. These promises are ones that are promised to believers, that it's a personal interaction. So we, we've seen now that we know that the Holy Spirit is in fact God. We, we saw that from the Old Testament even. And then when we get into the New Testament, we're looking at the Holy Spirit as a person, we're able to see interactions with the Father and the Son. We're also able to see interactions with other believers and, and how we, the Holy Spirit should interact with believers. But what about the world? What about those that, that don't know Christ? What, what about those that, that don't know Jesus? How does the, this, the Holy Spirit interact with them? Well, John answers that. John advises us as well on how that spirit, will, how the spirit will interact with the world. You see, the spirit's ministry of the world is one of exposing. John 16, 8 says, when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Jesus here is speaking of the helper, the counselor that will be sent following his ascension. The counselor's work of conviction is described in, in three acts. And we, we see them up there in that scripture, that there's going to be conviction of sin, righteousness and judgment. In the following verses, he even breaks this down as Jesus speaks on it further. John 16, 9 through 11 says this, concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world will be judged. And, you know, I, I love that we get a pretty good description there. You know, the first is concerning sin because they don't believe in me. And then we get righteousness because I'll go to the Father. You're not going to see me any longer. And we get a little bit of a, of a breakdown here. You know, the world's sin that, that's going to be judged there um, is definitely that it does not believe in Christ. He says it right there. And church, friends, family, guests, unbelief in Christ is the primary sin. Second, the world is told that righteousness rose from the dead to ascend to the right hand of the Father. The righteous judge himself is the one previously convicted by the world. I, I love this as it talks about the righteousness of Christ and that the world's only hope resides in turning to the judge and receiving his personal righteousness by faith in him. It's not through anything we do. It's not through anything any, anyone else can do other than the work of Christ and what he did on the cross. The Holy Spirit clearly works with the Son in revealing and enforcing that divine judgment, that divine truth that we all need Jesus. And that judgment's the third work of the Spirit. Verse 11 tells us um, 
that the ruler of this world is judged. So we got a big question here, right? We talk about, uh, we, we can understand the, the, the sin and, and being the, the primary sin, being unbelief in, in the work of Christ and, and what he's done for the world. And we're then told of the, the righteousness that comes from Christ. You know, we can even understand that, but we get to, okay, so now let's get to judgment and that the ruler of this world is judged. So that question is, who's the ruler of this world? I love John's gospel, the way it ties into the Old Testament, everything, you know, the rule of the world can be found back in Genesis 3 of worldly things is the serpent who led humanity into sin. The serpent has been waited, found wanting and eternally condemned through the victory of Christ. The only hope of this world is a shift in allegiance from the world to the kingdom of God. If the world receives salvation, they can be transferred from the world to the kingdom of God. They do this by knowing and submitting to Christ. And that conviction comes from the work of the Spirit. This message and the God-given knowledge about Jesus is the work of the church, and it is empowered by the Spirit. So that brings me to the closing question of the day. How should I respond to the Holy Spirit? How should you respond to the Holy Spirit? You know, the Gospel of John shows the personal identity of the Holy Spirit his relationship with the Father, the Son, the believers, and the world. It also shows how the Holy Spirit is the sovereign, transcendent, and eternal God. He's the comforter, imminent, and revealing God. So if the Holy Spirit is personal as identity, as the Gospel of John so clearly teaches, so clearly shows, and the Holy Spirit is clearly God, as we've shown throughout 1 Samuel, what does that mean for you personally? Well, the personal nature of God, the Holy Spirit, means that He's concerned with you. Not just because, not just for no reason, but from the comforting perspective of His intimate nearness. In God's sovereign love, the Father sent the Son to unite humanity permanently in the incarnation of Christ. The Son died for our sins and rose for, from death for our justification, offering us life through faith in Him. In God's love, He sent the Spirit to convict us of our sin, of the coming judgment, and of the righteousness available to us through the work of Jesus Christ. The Spirit now dwells within us, uniting us with the Son by faith. He enables us to return to the loving presence of the Father and the blessed vision of the light for which we were originally created. All the way back with Adam and Eve in that intimate relationship with God. Church, when we ask that question, how should I respond to the Spirit? That's a personal answer. If you're a believer and you've been baptized in the Spirit and you know God, it's our job to be empowered by the Spirit to take that message to the ends of the earth, to worship and glorify God for all that He's worth and share the good news of the gospel with everyone that we possibly can as that Spirit dwells in us. If you don't know about that baptism in the Spirit, if you, if you don't have that relationship with God, that intimate relationship with God, then I am just reaching out to you today to ask God into your heart, to accept the work of Christ that we talked about, that He's the one that takes that judgment away, and that through the work of the Son, what He did on the cross in His life, His death and resurrection, that you're offered eternal life with the Father. How we respond to the Spirit solely comes to our relationship with God. Thank you guys so much. And if you have questions, if you don't know that love, please send me email. I'd love to just start a conversation with you. Let, let's just have a chat. All that contact information is found below, and I would just love to hear from you. Let us pray. Father God, I just thank you so much for this day. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for our time together. I thank you for the opportunity to preach your word, God. God, as we've looked at the Trinity and the love that you have for us, God, that we were created in your image, that we, you sent us your son, God, to, to live a life we can't live, to die a death we deserve, and in defeating death, offer us eternal life with you. God, that you didn't even stop there. As Jesus sits at your right hand and intercedes for us, God, that you gave us the giver. God, that you came to be upon us in the Spirit. God, that you are with us and indwell in us to lead us, to teach us, to guide us. God, we just ask that, that we glorify you in all that we do. God, let us take every opportunity to show the love that you have for us to the world. 
Be with each of us today as we leave here. God, let all we do glorify you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.